Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Brad Scott, who is the author of Cloud Money, um, a book that's just out um, about money and how it works and how it doesn't work. <laughs> so before I talk with Brad about Cloud Money, um, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. Stake Wallet is your new favorite multi-chain mobile wallet that puts the power of Web3 at your fingertips. In just three tabs, um, you can stake and manage your assets on over 22 built-in protocols, including all major EVMs, Layer 2s, and non-EVMs like Cosmos, Solana, Nier, and more. Stake Wallet abstracts away all complexity while being fully self-custodial, meaning getting yield on your crypto has never been this easy and secure. Stake Wallet also has multi-chain NFT support, so you can view all your NFTs in one place and you can flex by putting your nicest NFT um, as your app background. Don't forget to check out the Explore section in the app for your daily fix of the hottest dApps, yields and news across chains. This summer, Stake Wallet is upgrading its app to, prov to, to provide you with more functionality um, than uh, many different DeFi dApps and wallets combined. And to highlight that transformation, Stake Wallet is also changing its name to Omni, the next generation super wallet. So if you want to try out Stake Wallet um, and join thousands of users on this next generation wallet, um, go to um, go and download it today on iOS or Android at stakewallet.fi. And that's um, spelled steak um, like the meat. And secondly, we would like to announce that uh, we as Epicenter, we are hiring. We are looking for a community manager to help grow our audience and take Epicenter to the next level. If you are passionate about crypto and creating great content, we want to hear from you. Full details can be found at careers.chorus.1 slash o slash epicenter minus community minus manager and the link can be found in the show notes as well please also share with anyone who you think might be a good fit for this brad thank you so much for coming on the show hey it's great to be here i'm a big fan of the show so i think i've been listening to it for like yeah a long time on and off so yeah cool <laughs> to be here super cool um We're here to talk about cloud money. This is your recent book about um, the banking system and the different banking systems that we often don't realize exist um, in parallel and unison. Um, maybe, maybe before we get into that, um, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself? Sure. I will try to do a short version of some sort. I'm from South Africa. Uh, my family's from Zimbabwe. So I grew up in Southern Africa and uh, yeah, I guess I kind of like, I studied uh, anthropology uh, at university. So I come from a kind of an economic anthropology background rather than an economics background. So um, I'm a big fan of the work of people like David Graeber and many other economic anthropologists. Um, but actually around the financial crisis, I worked in the financial sector, uh, partially out of a kind of anthropological desire to explore the financial system, which I found a very like fascinating place because I was also coming from quite a critical um, political kind of background. And I was very fascinated about the sort of mechanisms of finance and how this extremely powerful system that underpins the global capitalist order essentially works. So I actually ended up working in exotic derivative contracts for a couple of years in the midst of the financial crisis. Uh, for those of people who don't know exotic derivative contracts, they're just elaborate contractual bets upon things in the world. Um, I was personally working on inflation derivatives, uh, property derivatives, even longevity derivatives, uh, which are bets upon how long populations live for. So these are all very, they're considered exotic systems because they're just, they're just kind of like non-main, they're not like the most popular derivatives. So they're considered exotic. It's like an exotic flavor of ice cream rather than vanilla. Um, so that's, I was working on that stuff. And then I was commissioned to write a book after I left the, that sector called The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, which was, came in the wake of the Occupy movements 
uh, where these people realized there's lots of demand from the public to understand some of the mechanisms and workings of finance. So I wrote a book in 2013 or came out in 2013 called The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance. I had like a little bit of stuff on crypto in there, but it wasn't like a the sort of dominant topic. It was more looking at, you know, hedge funds and private equity, all this kind of stuff. With these. Um, and then I kind of became involved in alternative finance, uh, alternative, you know, alternative forms of money, alternative forms of banking and so on. And so I have a lot, a lot of experience around people who t attempted to build different styles of finance. Um, and this kind of eventually led me to look at the sort of the tech world, how it meets with, with the financial sector. Um, but I became quite critical about the fintech world and digital finance more generally. Um, and this was culminated in my, my latest book, Cloud Money, which is looking at how big tech and big finance are sort of fusing together and crushing the cash system in the process and how the crypto communities imagine themselves to be countering this potentially. It's super interesting to hear that you enter the finance field um, first and foremost out of an anthropological interest. That's what I've never heard before. So um, wh what are your anthropologists' findings about uh, the human in financial markets? Sure, the first thing I'll say is that there actually are academic anthropologists who do go and do ethnographic research and, and finance. So people like Karen Ho, for example, is a person who did, she did a book, I, forget, I think it was called Liquidated maybe, I forget the actual name of it. But you know, that's like this very academic anthropology of finance. So there's a whole sort of scene around these sort of academic anthropologists. I had more of a kind of like, maybe you want to call it a kind of gonzo journalism type style, which is like less academic. It's just more kind of experiential. So I was... I wasn't actually officially sort of studying the financial sector as, a, as an official academic anthropologist. I was just doing it for myself um, with a kind of loosely anthropological mindset in the process, right? So I'd be in these like meetings with like big skyscrapers with like fund managers and stuff. And um, there'd be part of my brain, which was like, this is really like fascinating. Like what's, this is like watching what they're doing and how they imagine what they're doing and all this kind of stuff, you know, whilst I was actually involved in, uh, working with these people. So, um, you know, and I guess one of the most interesting things in it is that you kind of realize how sort of diverse these sectors are. A lot of people who are sort of critical of finance often imagine that there's a kind of uniformity within a powerful system like the financial sector. They often imagine that there's particular people with particular political outlooks, but actually you find a huge diversity of people. Um, but what you do find are certain evolutionary processes whereby if you don't make profit for the firm, you get ejected. All right. So really, these are kind of amoral institutions. They, uh, which will, uh, you know, operate at this huge transnational scale. And if you don't eventually align with their interests, you act. Right. And this is partially what ends up creating these sort of systemic effects in the financial sector. So it's not that there's like bad bankers. It's just really that there's a structure that is uh, extractive that will uh, do certain things in the world. Um, that's a very high level description, but uh, it's quite fascinating, obviously, being in these institutions. Right now, if you, for example, in big tech, you'll probably be experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. I, I think that's uh, that's probably a um, very valid take on the parallelisms between banking and big tech. But tell us how you got into the into the fintech um, universe or how you started being interested in the technology behind finance, because that's quite a stretch from um, from kind of uh, exotic derivatives and hedge funds and banking in general, right? It's a very particular flavor. Sure. Well, the, my, my first book, The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, was very much pitched as at least one part of it was, um, it was sort of framed in like hacker philosophy partly, which is like, you know, you go and explore a system. So I was encouraging people to, firstly go and explore systems to understand the underlying workings um, but the sort of secondary effect of that is that you can try to start to like mess with them or sort of rewire them right so a lot of that book was looking at alternative finance you know how would you build an alternative style of money how would you build alternative um you know structures and so i was using the term alternative finance and this is back in 2013 so that book's a bit out outdated now but um lots of people in the tech sector had a self-image that they were disruptors and also trying to build alternative forms of finance. Lots of fintech entrepreneurs like to use the term alternative finance to refer to what they were doing as well. 
so there was this kind of crossover between uh what i was doing and i saw i started getting invited into a lot of these sort of circles um to kind of you know uh go and talk or whatever or take part in projects and stuff um but i started to do, realize that you know a lot of what was referred to as alternative finance back in you know like 2013 2014 2015 in these fintech circles was basically just financial automation right they would basically just be taking the same financial system and automating it right so be like hey automate insurance claims you know automate loan decision processes you know whatever it is automate trading like, like this, is, this is what fintech was, uh, its big claim was. And essentially the idea was through the process of automation of whatever it is you wanted to automate, uh, you would lower the costs because you'd basically be firing people and like uh, standardizing processes. Um, and this would enable finance to spread more because one of the things that keep, traditionally keeps big financial institutions out of certain populations is that they're not profitable enough. Right. So uh, banks don't go and target particular demographics precisely because they can't make money out of them because the fixed costs of providing those services are too high sometimes. So automation is one technique by which you lower the costs and thereby spread the power of the financial sector or spread its, 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 uh, its reach, which is sometimes called financial inclusion. Right. So and the fintech sector was often specializing in doing this. And this was their sort of claim to being alternative. Right. So um and I became quite sort of skeptical about that that viewpoint and that sort of, uh, uh, but I mean, there's lots of interesting things in FinTech, but uh, that's how I became involved in looking at that, that intersection. Okay, so tell us about the central thesis of cloud money. Yeah, well, cloud money, you can you can look at it at sort of different levels. On At a sort of very surface level, it's uh, a defense of the physical cash system. Um, Interestingly, many people in crypto circles historically would have uh, come out of, you know, a lot of the cypherpunk movements, which led to the, you know, the origins of Bitcoin and stuff, you know, were looking forward in the future and saying, hey, in some hypothetical future cashless society, there's going to be huge problems of surveillance and censorship, et cetera. Um, and we need to be forming some alternative form of digital cash, right? And so there's lots of these intuitive concerns about what if the cash system goes down? Um, so in some ways I'm channeling some of that same tradition, um, but rather than like promoting say crypto, I'm actually promoting cash, <laughs> like I'm making a defense for why the cash system needs to be protected, right? Which is controversial because it goes against the grain of most mainstream debates right now, which take digitization and automation as for granted. They just say, this is happening. You can't do anything about it and just get used to it. Right. Whereas I'm actually making a strong counter argument for why you actually do need to protect physical money systems. Um, so that's the sort of like surface level of it. But that is, if you sort of zoom out, what cloud money is looking at is, you know, broad processes of corporate capitalism saying uh, if you if you kind of like press play on a large scale capitalist system, it'll tend towards accumulation of power in large corporations which will attempt to fuse with each other and form like huge oligopolies right and right now the tech sector and the finance sector are the ones that are kind of doing that the tech sector can't actually operate unless it fuses with the finance sector you can't have these global tech empires unless you have these huge globe spanning digital money systems so the ideology that emerges from that that process going on is one that's anti-cash so you'll find in sort of mainstream circles, it's just taken for granted that there's something wrong with the cash system. And that if you haven't yet, quote unquote, updated to digital money, it's because you're somehow like slow or it's you've, you've lacked the opportunity to yet upgrade. Um, but there's actually many people in the world who actually prefer the cash system and who want to keep the cash system, but their voices are never heard because it doesn't go with the grain of the ideological structure of our economy, right? So... Um, and so I'm basically arguing that the cash system kind of stands in the way of the fusion between big finance and big tech. Um, and the actual, the crypto world in an interesting way is a kind of, is coming out of that saying, actually sort of partly agreeing with the, the mainstream narrative and saying, you can't stop automation. You can't stop this sort of acceleration process. So what we're going to do is work with it and build alternative forms of digital money, right? Um, which is a viable approach. I mean, it's a, I, I understand the intuition, but I'm sort of like putting the crypto world in the context of this, of this bigger battle. 
There is a lot to unpack here. Um, maybe let's start in the beginning because I think money is something that we, um, all of us, use all the time and often um, with very little thought about how it actually works or w what it is at its heart. Um, so if, if I go to like the very first central thesis of the book, um, it's that not all money is created equally, right? So basically, so that you, you, you very much pit um, the notion of central bank money um, against the notion of commercial bank money. Can, can you explain that? Sure, yeah, this is, um, there's multiple dimensions upon which I could discuss the monetary system. Um, one thing I'll immediately say is when, as a sort of backdrop to this, is that sometimes when economists are discussing money, they use this terrible approach, which they call the functions of money approach, which is, I'm just going to go out and say it's an atrocious approach, right? It's really atrocious, and I wish it was just scrapped. Right. But they basically talk about money in terms of these functions. You know, it's like describing, you know, a chair as like a thing you can sit on right? rather than describing what an actual chair is. Right. Um, and so they, they do this thing. Right. And they never describe the structure of money. They never describe like what the actual institutions are, what's actually happening. Um, and there can be different structures of money over time. Right. Which might achieve certain similar things. But there's you've got to kind of like describe these structures. So a, lot of, a lot of the time I'm doing is sort of trying to describe what the current structure of money is, um, is a sort of triple tiered system where there's at least three different issuers of, of what we call money right now. Um, and so, for example, something like the US dollar is actually at least three different forms of money with the same name. Okay, and it'll be similar with the euro system or any other system. Um, and at the core, there's uh, these state players who are issuing, and this gets slightly complex, but a form of IOU. So by IOU, I mean like a kind of promissory, um, a promissory uh, instrument. All right. And uh, so first tier money is these kind of like state promises, if you want to call it that. So it's, there's, there's different ways to describe it uh, that are issued out and pulled back in. So a large part of the sort of monetary dynamics is about issuance outwards and pulling back in, issuance outwards, pulling back in. There's this kind of like pulsating structure to the monetary system. Um, and so it's dynamic. It sort of expands and morphs and changes. Um, incidentally, this is something that like, for example, Bitcoin is hate. Right? Uh, it can't, really don't like this idea of expansion contraction. They kind of like, like the idea of like rigid structures that sort of like stay fixed. Right. So, but in our actual monetary system, there's this like expansion contraction processes, but it's occurring on at least three separate levels. So there's at the state level, it's sort of tier one level it's occurring, but then there's a sort of secondary layer, which is the commercial bank money system, whereby commercial banks will take that first tier money and take ownership of it and issue a second layer of money. Um, one of the ways I use to describe this actually with a simple metaphor is to think about casinos. Um, so if you take your mind briefly away from the monetary system and think about a casino, if you walk into a casino with like, let's say, let's use, let's use the US dollar right now, but like I, I walk in with a hundred US dollars into a casino. Um, I'm holding a first tier unit of money there. I hand it to the cashier. They take ownership of that and they issue me a hundred dollars worth of chips, right? Now that chip that I suddenly hold in the casino is a second tier form of money. It's actually a promise for the first tier of money, but I, it now operates independently. I can use it within the casino. And I'm guessing right now, for example, in the crypto world, this is like the, the distinction between layer one and layer two stuff, right? You can kind of create these secondary forms on top of primary forms, but like, just as looking forward, but like in the, in the, in the monetary system, this is happening all the time, right? You, when you go to, for example, deposit cash in a bank, they will take ownership of that and issue you a second tier form of digital chip, as it were, you know, kind of equivalent to a casino chip, um, but in digital form and in an account structure. All right. And so when you're looking at a bank account and you see numbers there, those are basically privately issued chips issued out by commercial banks. And uh, you can then develop secondary tiers upon that. For example, PayPal can take ownership of that second layer and issue a third layer, all right, which is kind of like a stable coin. Um, but uh, so you have these basically these chains of, of, of money um, that are issued out. And of course, 
In that second layer of the commercial banking sector, one of the biggest, most controversial areas is the fact that commercial banks can issue out far more of those digital chips than they have in government money, right? Which is often called fractional reserve banking, um, more accurately referred to as credit creation of money. They basically can just issue out digital chips and then manage their reserves in the background, all right? Um, and they do that through the process of issuing loans, which I can go into if you want me to. Um, but what we call, just you know, just to sort of wrap it up slightly, what, what we call the cashless society would really be a society where you transition from being able to use those first tier form of government money and you would be forced to use uh, bank issued or corporate issued digital chips for payments, right? Which has a bunch of immediate implications, right? Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> There's, uh, that's that's an initial initial exploration for you. Let, let, let's talk about the implications that it would have if we were all forced to use digital money exclusively. Well, I mean, if you're using that metaphor, I'm just I just uh, uh, use there on the sort of um, this digital chips, right? The, the normal account structures of banks, you basically require this, this intermediary to engage in any form of payment, right? So um, in order for me to basically move digital money around, I have to send a message to some kind of institution and ask them to do it on my behalf, right? So this is the normal uh, account-based digital money systems that we use right now. So I use my phone or I use my computer or I use an actual telephone and call them. There's many different ways I can contact the institution and I say, hey, you've issued me digital chips. Please, can you like retract them from me and give them to somebody else, right? That's the kind of digital money system in a very like crude you know, description. But you can immediately from there see the kind of implications of if you're forced to use that system. Well, for the first implication is that, well, it obviously gives those institutions lots of economic power. So for example, in a country like the UK, where the banking sector is already incredibly powerful and too big to fail, forcing people to use ever more of that like digital money system basically still like reinforces the power of the banking sector, which is a political problem because having one industry too powerful in the country creates a bunch of political distortion. So just at some basic level, this is like a bad thing, right? Um, but then more specifically, obviously it enables surveillance. They can watch everything you're doing. And that's something that libertarians often get very sort of immediately aware of is the sort of implication for being watched. Um, by commercial institutions in this case, which can then obviously be tapped in by the government can tap into that and, and watch these institutions too. Um, that subsequently leads to, to, for example, the ability to censor. So you say, well, you know, right now, for example, if I'm a political dissident, I have the option to use the cash system, which can't be remotely tracked or remotely sort of stopped. Um, and that I can engage in forms of activity like that. But if, if I'm suddenly now forced to use these digital systems, and when I say forced, I don't necessarily mean like the state forcing me. It could be some uh, network coercion effect where basically like the banks and, and, and these other groups have basically managed to like recalibrate our networks or when I, our, our economic system such that you have to use these systems. So for example, in London right now, it's, it's, it's largely not a choice anymore to use digital money. You kind of have to, all right? So once you kind of get forced into that situation, um, obviously you now have, if a bank says, we're going to stop you doing something, they can. Or if the government orders them to stop you doing something, they can, right? It has huge resilience problems, right? Because of course, as you become dependent on these institutions, uh, they become points for attack, right? So if you're doing cyber attacks, you want to ground an economy to a halt, you just attack the banking sector, um, or you attack the, the Visa and MasterCard network. So you, there's this lack, it becomes a huge nightmare for, for resilience of systems. Um, but it also, finally, it enables centralization of power because if you think about how organizations like Amazon work, they basically, like they can't, they can't operate with a cash system. It just goes directly against centralization of power. Cash inherently is localized and peer-to-peer -peer in the way it moves around. It comes from a central authority, but it, then it percolates around in a sort of very localized peer-to-peer -peer kind of way. Um, if you're, if you're a, a, an Amazon in the world and you want to be able to operate at scale, and at speed, you have to you you want to deal with Visa and Mastercard and the banking sector. You don't want to deal with individual people trying to send you cash, all right? So in terms of like changing the structure of the economy, corporate centralization depends upon digital money, right? Whereas cash has this like inherent drag; it creates localization and, and the sort of like um, human scale activity. So these are the, the main categories of issues. 
So um, before we kind of go into each of these issues at uh, more depth, um, le let's talk um, about the arguments that people who are proponents for the cashless society often bring. Um, so things like AML and CTF um, uh, concerns, so anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism um, issues, um, and tax evasion. How do you feel about these, or do you think these are valid reasons to kind of reject um, a cash for society? There's two approaches here. If, you, if you're wanting to counter the arguments of the sort of uh, anti-cash propagandists, and there are many of these people, um, bear in mind anti-cash propaganda is probably like the standard, the standard line in most innovation circles. Um, so there's two ways to counter it. You either like attack each claim as they make it. So for example, with tax evasion, you say, well, actually the banking sector facilitates super large scale tax avoidance and it uses the normal banking sector. It uses digital money. All right. Like it doesn't use a cash system. There's huge amounts of tax avoidance that, that happen just via the normal bank payment system. All right. Um, or for example, safety. Safety is another one that's often uh, talked about. Like, hey, yeah, you can get mugged if you have cash. It's like, well, you can get hacked too and they can drain your entire bank account. Um, unlike with cash where you can have maybe a, a part of your money taken but not your full savings, right? Um, Uh, there's many of these kind of like, sometimes cash the taxes being dirty, especially during the pandemic, uh, which has been proved to be like totally unscientific in terms of a, a, an actual disease vector. Um, but even then, like, uh, you know, the uh, Bank for International Settlements and all these like people in Bank of England who d did studies on this would say, actually, you know, automated checkout counter screens and the pin pads on card terminals are more contaminated than not units of cash are. All right. So... Um, so you can you can go through each claim that's made um, and dispute them. Actually, one of the other big ones is that you know cash facilitates crime and cash uh, facilitates all this kind of like uh, dark money kind of stuff. But it's like, well, yeah, maybe so. Maybe a small percentage is used for that. But it comes with an inherent limitation, right? If you're a transnational criminal, you really don't want to use a cash system. It slows you down. It's physical. You have to actually try and transport it across borders and like suitcases. There is an inherent like limitation to the cash system for transnational criminals. And, you know, there's stories of these like big, you know, drug kingpins who like bury their, their cash and then it actually like rots away because they can't actually store it properly. So there's, there's interesting like crime prevention features built into the cash system in the sense that it actually slows stuff down. Whereas if you're operating on like actual transnational digital systems, it becomes much easier to do like transnational crime. Um, so for each of the claims made, you can like counter it. But even if we took the claims made by the um, anti-cash proponents seriously, you could still say, look, there are trade-offs in society. And even if the cash system comes with certain problems, the benefits it brings outweigh those problems, all right? So you might be a zealous anti-cash campaigner saying, hey, this will help to solve corruption and tax evasion, and you destroy the cash system. And now you've suddenly created a whole bunch of new problems. You've created surveillance, you've created a lack of resilience, and also you create a huge amount of exclusion, all right, in your society. Um, in terms of many people actually can't use the digital systems and rely upon this, this uh, public infrastructure, the cash. But, you know, one of the biggest things is resilience. I mean, the uh, Federal Reserve, I was chatting to some Federal Reserve employees about this. It's like when a hurricane's approaching the U.S., there's a huge demand in cash. There's a huge increase in cash demand because people just know it's just like offline money is way better to have when you're in the middle of a storm. Like it's literally more advanced in that situation. Right um, now, you suddenly want to get rid of it. Okay, it's fine. Maybe you you sort of half solve a little bit of the tax evasion question through that process, but now you've like screwed the resilience of your monetary system, which is a bigger problem. Right. So this is the kind of way I would I, I tend to approach those <laughs> those questions. Okay. So, I mean, clearly there's different kind of clusters of issues here, right? So basically, there's uh, the resilience issue. Uh, and obviously, this comes with being um, a uh, a form of a payment um, that that with cash being a form of payment that you don't need electricity for, you don't need reception, and so on. Um, you you just need to 
have a piece of paper in your hand. Um, the the other um, uh, part being the privacy concerns, namely that basically everything you spend money on is on record, which is not the case if you have um, cash on you. Um, and the third concern um, is the centralization of power in for-profit organizations, um, kind of the fintech, Amazon kind of group of concerns, right? So basically, maybe let's tackle them one by one. So basically, I think the security or the resilience um, point of view, I think this goes without saying that something that has fewer contingencies works better, works better in particularly in crisis situations. But let's talk about the data privacy um, uh, argument. I know a couple of years ago, there were these, when, when Facebook still was a thing, or when Facebook still was a thing in our circles, there was a figure going around how much your data is actually worth to Facebook a year. Do you know, do you have an idea how much the, the financial data that we kind of leave behind in, in, you know, in terms of paper trails for cashless payments, how much that is actually worth on a, on a per person basis? I don't know that. No, there's no, there's no. As far as I know, there's no sort of official studies. I mean, these 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 studies are quite dubious in their methodologies, anyway. Um, in terms of how much can be extracted from from financial data, I mean, you can probably work out an elaborate way to do it, um, by, by looking at the different uses of it for for different organizations. So, for example, Google, um, or Alphabet now, I guess. Um, one of the reasons why they want to track payments. Uh, data and they they've entered into deals with the big data brokers to do this is they want to be able to for example measure the effectiveness of online advertising right so if i see some like ad on google i might not actually immediately use it to purchase something online i might actually it might sort of seep into my consciousness and later manifest as me like buying something from a shop now if they can find a way to correlate you know, credit card or debit card payments with my viewing of an ad, um, that becomes a way for them to sort of like make these like um, correlations and start to like make claims um, about the effectiveness of their advertising. So this is obviously for the advertisers is a big thing, like being able to prove that their adverts are effective. So that's like one use. For the banking sector, obviously, which runs the underlying account infrastructure of all of this, like for them... Uh, watching payments data is one of the methods via which they determine, say, credit worthiness, right? You can gain a huge amount of information from people's payments data about how credit worthy they are, right? By watching the inflows and outflows and doing this kind of stuff. So, if, you know, in terms of like their profitability of their, their loans and so on like that, that becomes a big um, data is one of the big aspects of that. Also, like cross-selling products, being able to, you know, what Facebook does right now is, you know, they they would make these profiles of you and then sort of sell access to third parties to sort of sell you stuff based on your profile. Um, banks can do that themselves. They can either be selling third party access or interdivision, interdivision is that the word, like you know, cross division uh, access. So their insurance division can see certain things about you and so on. Um, I don't exactly know how to calculate the exact uh, <laughs> Uh, sort of monetary value of this, but it's very, very clear there's a big incentive to try and gather as much of this data as, as, as it can. Um, and obviously the cash system represents a kind of often small scale transactions, right? So historically, most people are using the digital systems for their big transactions like rent and so on, right? But they're not gonna, for their everyday transaction, the kind of like granular stuff, often the cash system is like hiding that and taking and sort of removing that data. Um, which is why, you know, there's this kind of like this kind of data grab as the sort of, you know, if, you're in, if you're in London right now, the amount of financial data being generated through contactless tapping is huge compared to like 10 years ago. There's now an enormous amount, new amount of data. Now, whether banks and these other organizations can actually monetize that or make use of it is a sort of separate question, right? They, if they can actually figure out how to do like AI methodologies or whatever, like big data methodologies to make use of it is a kind of a separate question i think but that's the basic point is that there's now this new frontier brett um do do banks actually are they allowed to sell this data so basically say i i have an account with say revolut and i use my card for everything so basically i have it like five to ten times a day for whatever this is a fictional example um but 
uh, is Revolut allowed to sell my payment data to third party uh, service providers like the Amazons or Googles and so on of the world? Well, they're not really like, like taking like sell it, right? So uh, there are, I mean, this gets complex because it depends on what jurisdiction you're in and which particular country you're talking about. And I don't know the details of every single financial data law right now. But the basic idea is, so for example, you know, Facebook doesn't technically sell your data. It'll hold the data and sell third party access to you, right? So they'll say, we know something about a person um, and we will offer this to you as an advertiser. And I know this, I mean, I've used Facebook for advertising before. You can sort of like tailor who the person is and then you don't actually know the data, right? But you're, you're getting access based on Facebook's knowledge. So they're not technically selling it in the situation, but they're, they're using it to curate access. Um, and, but in terms of actual sharing of data, yes, there's a whole bunch of um, inter collaborative data sharing models that banks and other financial institutions will have. Some of them created through like regulation, right? But for example, like credit scoring agencies are basically these like data sharing clubs where these groups come together like Experian and they say things like, if we all, will all be collectively better if we share data with each other. If you guys share data with each other, you will all like have a better idea of what's going on. So we'll enter into these deals where we can sort of uh, experiment will kind of sit in the middle and act as this intermediary for the data um, and banks can tap into it and governments allow that right based on these like I guess concerns about financial stability they say well actually it'd be good to have data sharing and between these, these institutions um, so yeah I mean again I don't necessarily want to go into the or well, I don't necessarily know all the specific uh, legal stuff around that there are specific scholars who literally study like the, the minutia of financial data laws. Um, but no, banks can't just like randomly sell data to anybody. I mean, that's, that's protected by, by financial privacy laws, um, but they can certainly enter into these like deals where they're, where they're sharing it. It sounds like um, a part of your issue with the system is, is, is that banks are um, an extractive force, right? So basically, if you look at kind of value that's being created for humanity, uh, banks kind of try to siphon part of that off without, without always um, giving a uh, service of equal value in return. So basically, if you were to remove this um, profit layer, if, for instance, um, we had a central bank um, that issued um, that issued central bank money to private citizens, kind of like the CBDC models that have been pioneered by um, a handful of states so far. But uh, I mean, I think more or less every other state kind of has plans to do so eventually. Um, wh what's your take on central bank digital currencies? Does this make it better or does it exacerbate the problem? Well, look, I don't necessarily think of the world in terms of like straightforward, like goods and bads. Often I'm looking at contradictions and trade-offs, right? So uh, I don't necessarily even claim that the banking sector is... Um, the banking sector, if you're trying to hold together a large-scale capitalist economy, this is how you do it, right? It's just like they're a crucial foundational component of how the monetary system works. So if, if the question is like, you know, do you want to keep that system running and intact? It's like, well, yes, these institutions are core to how that happens, right? Um, so if you're like a financial regulator, you're very concerned about the stability of the banking sector precisely because they're such a foundational part of the economy um, in terms of like holding the monetary system in the, in the credit extension processes, right? Um, but that comes with a bunch of negative things. For example, concentrated power in the banking sector, huge amounts of economic inequality by, where, by which financial elites become insanely wealthy, right? Um, and get a stranglehold over the political system. Um, and all these new ones that I'm mentioning, right? Surveillance, all these things. It's like, fine, you're gonna, you can be able to run a large-scale capitalist economy, but you're going to have to take this other stuff with it as well. All right? Now, the CBDC debate is kind of like you've got to see it in this context um the cbdc debate is quite 
fascinating and multi uh, multi dimensional. The first thing I'll say about the CBDC debate is a lot of people in the crypto community have come to a slightly uh, slightly delusional consciousness that somehow it's related to Bitcoin or somehow it's related to the crypto world, which it's not, right? Um, it might be partially related, but it's it's really the CBDC debate uh, precedes the crypto world, all right? So basically, in the previous incarnation of our monetary system, we had this sort of balance between um, going back to that image I was using earlier of these different layers of the monetary system. You would have the state issuing the physical cash, um, and you would have the banking sector issuing these digital chips, right? So you'd have physical state money and digital bank money, okay? And then there was a third hidden part of the monetary system, which is digital state money, right? Uh, which is often just in, in monetary parlance jargon called reserves, right? Which is the digital equivalent of, it's, well, a digital analog of cash or something like that. Like it's, um, but it's only usable by the banking sector, all right? So CBDC already exists. It's only that, banks have exclusive usage of it. We can't personally use it. We have to use the physical version, right? Which is the cash system, okay? Now that's the traditional power balance. The state has a sort of like physical money and then the banking sector controls the digital money. Um, now, because the banking sector and all these players like Visa and MasterCard have spent so long undermining the cash system because it goes against their profit impulse. So they've been undermining it. It's creating financial stability problems, right? Because if the cash system actually deteriorates far enough, you have the implosion of public access to state money, right? Now, this, is, this becomes a very bad problem in the context of actual like financial crises, for example, where what happens during a financial crisis is people often try to pull out of the banking sector and go back to safer forms of money. So like, for example, in a bank run, people are going to the ATM which is a little bit, if you're using my like casino metaphor, it's like conceptually equivalent to like running back to the cashier with your casino chips and saying, hey, give me back my cash, right? I'm redeeming my chip back for cash, right? Now, because the banking sector issues out lots more than these chips than they actually have in, in cash, it's just, it's just like people rush for the exits. They try to like get it out uh, before the system implodes, okay? Now, in a situation where you don't have no access to cash or no access to state money, you can actually have huge problems for the overall like, confidence in the monetary system. People need access to state-issued money to believe in the second-tier chips, okay? Now, because, of, because the second-tier chips in their physical form are being undermined, the state's now thinking, you know, oh, crap, maybe we need to start issuing these digital ones. So, for example, it's no surprise that Sweden was the first country to start thinking about the e-krona, Precisely because in Sweden, they basically let the cash system deteriorate to such a level that they are now in a real problem, a real trouble. Okay, so the CBDC debate has to be seen in that context. For some countries, if you're, in, if you're a low down the geopolitical pecking order and you have a, 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 a in your currency is sort of like a weak currency within the global system, you could be inspired by things like Libra. All right, so this is like these third tier stablecoin, corporate stablecoin systems um, could have a chance of outcompeting your local money through this digital technology. So for some smaller countries, they have been partially inspired by like the stablecoin world for thinking about their CBDCs, right? But not for like a mainstream, it's not that the euro is not thinking about that, right? So... But the, the CBDC creates a huge problem because what will start to happen is the central banks will start to compete with their own banks on, a, on the digital, pl on digital playing field, right? Which if you're a capitalist state, which many of these states are, is a bad problem because you don't want to undermine your own banking sector, all right? So I'm always surprised by like libertarians in the US, for example, they're, they're com com completely like fixated on this idea that like maybe like the... The, the Federal Reserve will start issuing the CBDC and it's going to start like doing this nefarious surveillance. But I'm like, well, you do realize the U.S. government's like a massively capitalist government. Um, the U.S. government does not want to destroy the American banking sector. All right. So it's true that it might have a desire to have increased surveillance, but it also doesn't want to just like uh, wreck Bank of America. 
Okay, so they'll be very, very careful about how they design that. They'll probably say stuff like, well, if we do issue a CBDC, you can only use very small amounts of it or up to a certain, certain amount before you have to go back to the banking sector, right? Because they're trying to protect their banking systems. That's super interesting to, to, to learn, uh, especially that uh, you think there's going to be um, uh, limits on how much CBDC uh, private people will be able to spend. Let's talk about the limitless spending uh, in blockchain. Um, so blockchain um, technology has the power to kind of disintermediate um, the uh, payment process um, in that Basically, the the central uh, the, the commercial bank um, go betweens are replaced by um, this consensus network. So it, it already sounded like you are intensely critical of the ecosystem. Um, let's maybe start there. So how do you see this entire movement? Because I mean, it's been around for a long time, right? So we, basically, we've had uh, digital gold, digicash, and so on e-gold and um and basically it's kind of it's it's um changed it it's moved over the last 30 40 years um into uh the first real uh blockchain currency bitcoin like 15 years ago uh, and uh yeah i mean now there's obviously myriad different ones out there um what are your views on the ecosystem I have complex views on the ecosystem. Um, I was an early user of Bitcoin. I was actually an early user of Dogecoin as well. Um, I was involved in the sort of early London Bitcoin scene. Um, partially, again, I have this, this anthropological kind of side to me where I like to actually just explore systems through experience. So I was always just very like gung-ho to just try out systems and see what was happening and sort of feel the dynamics. So I spent quite a lot of time with the early crypto community. Yeah, and I, initially with things like Bitcoin, I find them really, really fascinating. And I was quite, like relatively uncritical at the beginning. You know, like many people who come into crypto are initially very uncritical, right? It's a little bit like when there's like a new convert to some kind of like exciting movement. They become like, you know, more Catholic than the Pope. This, this sort of, you know, become very, very like hyped up about it. And they're just like, um, and if you're a person who's like further down the line, who's become a bit more like subtle about it, the person who's like in the early stages believes that you haven't entered the first stage yet. <laughs> they think that you still haven't realized, right? So I, I often have this in my like crypto commentary. I have all these like newbie crypto people being like, ah, you don't yet understand the brilliance of these systems because you've never bothered to try them and all this kind of stuff, you know, which is of course like slightly irritating. But, uh, you know, I was, I was involved in them, but I guess my first uh, doubts started to emerge, which was I, I could see that there was a bifurcation in the Bitcoin system between the technology and the monetary theory. All right. And they're related to each other in complex ways. But from a technological perspective, the system was highly radical. All right. So if you're thinking about a sort of very broad brush description of something like Bitcoin, you could say, well, it's a means to move tokens between people without the banking sector being involved. All right. That sort of superficially sounds quite profound, right? So for digital tokens, it's historically, it's a hard problem. Like, how do you move them between people without a central intermediary kind of like keeping score? Okay. Now, that was authentically interesting. A system by which a large network of strangers, people who don't know each other across the world, can somehow form consensus on the movement of tokens. I mean, that's authentically interesting, right? That's uh, actually many political groups can agree that that's interesting. You can say if you're a left-wing anarchist, you might find that fascinating. If you're like a right-wing libertarian or somebody who's like super anti-state and stuff from a sort of more kind of market perspective, you might find it fascinating. So there's quite a lot of interest around, around that from the technological perspective. But that technological infrastructure, partly through its design, was forced into a very conservative position on money. All right. So there's fixation upon like hard money. Now, hard money historically is a conservative way of thinking about money in the sense that it imagines that money should be this constrained commodity. Um, and there's a lot of subtlety to this. Um, it draws very, very heavily upon a commodity orientation to money. 
Um, and when I say a commodity orientation to money, I don't mean um, people literally believe money is a commodity. It's a, it's a way of thinking about money in which you imagine it's like a commodity. Okay, it's an orientation. It's a, it's a mode of thinking. All right. So the crypto world was very heavily influenced by commodity orientations to money where they imagine like money is like a thing with value and you have to like grab it and move it around. All right. Um, and so like the, the de facto, the, all the messaging, all the imagery around Bitcoin is around this idea that it's like we're going to use this radical decentralized architecture for quite a constrained conservative form of money. Okay. Uh, and this is where it bifurcates away from sort of more like my political orientations, right? Because I come from more a kind of anthropological, more left-leaning, anarchisty sort of way of thinking about the world. Um, and yeah, so in reality, and I'll, I'll try to close this off now, but like in reality, the Bitcoin system is quite fascinating because um, it isn't, it doesn't actually, and this is where it gets very controversial, right? I actually think Bitcoin's a very successful system, all right? But I believe it's successful because it's a parasite, all right? Now, when I say parasite, I don't mean that with some like value judgment laden kind of way, right? If you look at an ecosystem, parasites are often very effective, right? They work, they survive, they do what they do. They can actually be very good, right, uh, at doing what they do. I think Bitcoin system is a parasitic system that rides upon a bunch of things and it depends on host systems. It depends upon the US dollar, but it parasites upon it. Now, this is how I see it working, but this conflicts with the self-image of the Bitcoin community, which imagines that actually this is an apex predator that's about to like destroy the US dollar system. Okay, so I actually see Bitcoin as a very successful system and very good at having certain marginal use cases. For example, for example, if I am actually like a political refugee, I can use this parasitic system to bridge between different places I'm going. There's, there's things I can do with it, right, uh, that are very useful. But it's not, it's not about to bring down the US dollar system. In fact, it depends upon the US dollar system in order to work, right, via a process called counter trade, which I often talk about and... I spend lots of time having these debates with like Bitcoin is about that. But my critiques about Bitcoin can be separated from my sort of more general interest in the broader space. Obviously, the Ethereum community and stuff does a lot broader things than Bitcoin. Um, so I am quite like interested in lots of these sort of more interesting um, experiments in the broader space. So I don't want to somehow just lump my take on Bitcoin with everything else. In terms of... Um talking about a constrained view on monetary uh, system, do you refer solely to the fact that there's like this uh, 21 million cap for Bitcoin, um, that there's, that, you know, you can't, and I mean, I, I, I know that this is what Bitcoiners hark on about all the time, that basically it's sound money because uh, uh, th there's uh, not an infinite supply of it. This is not true for a lot of other cryptocurrencies, right? So, I mean... Things like uh, Ethereum, for instance, there's not a capped supply. Does this change your judgment? No, not really. I mean, look, bear in mind, to, to understand my position would probably take a little while because you've got to unpeel a bunch of layers of stuff around monetary systems. So, and that takes, takes quite a long time. Um, but, but let me just say this, okay. In the normal monetary system, when I see a number in front of me, it's actually, a, it's actually, it, it's an asset to me. All right. So if I look at my bank account, that's an asset to me. But on the other side of that, if you like look around it, on the other side is a liability, all right? It's actually a liability issued out by the banking sector, right? So it's experience is created by the banking sector as a liability, essentially as a promise, right? When I owe you now, and it's also a liability for a liability. Okay. So it's a second tier promise right so and we don't, we don't need to go into the structure of that but basically in the normal monetary system um there's a double-sided nature to it it has both an asset and a liability side and this is partly what creates the circuit the circuit like structure of the monetary system is the interaction between the issuers of money and the users of money so the users of money are the people who perceive it as an asset all right the everyday person perceives money as an asset But there's a shadow side, which is the liability side, which is the issuer side. And it's a totally different way of looking at money. Now, in the crypto world, historically, it's asset only. 
it's only it's only seen as an asset. So for example, when you're looking at like a Bitcoin miner, when they're quote unquote creating new tokens, they're basically like writing out numbers after exerting energy and attributing them to themselves as an asset. All right. The banking sector does not do this. The banking sector issues money out as a liability. There's a completely different structure, even though they superficially look like they might look like numbers on a screen. Um, in reality, when you start to delve into the crypto world, this becomes very, very fascinating. And you ask yourself, what are the tokens, at least in, say, Bitcoin? They're literally numbers, right? And I wrote a very controversial piece about this called iToken, which is looking at the difference between, uh, and stop me if this gets too weird, but like the difference between numbers as nouns and numbers as adjectives, okay? So in most everyday usage of numbers, we're using numbers as adjectives. So if I say there's three cups on the table, um, the three is referring to something beyond itself, all right? Right. Whereas if I say there are three, there is three, I'm actually referring to the three itself as a mathematical object. All right. It's actually a noun. So when mathematicians are talking about numbers, they're using them as nouns. They say three plus three is six. Those are nouns. All right. Whereas if I said like three dogs, uh, that's like an adjective. Now, in the normal monetary system, numbers are actually adjectives. All right. So when, Again, that's a complex topic, but in the in the Bitcoin system, they're literally nouns, right? They're literally mathematical objects written out that then have monetary branding pasted over them, all right? A monetary language, which is why there's this huge effort in the Bitcoin community to create this idea that like these numbers that you're moving around are actually aren't numbers. They're like objects. They're like sort of like gold or something, right? There's this huge cultural effort that's required to convince somebody that the number is something more than a number, all right? The normal monetary system doesn't have this problem because it has this liability structure, all right? Um, and this will apply regardless of the supply of the tokens, all right? So I can say for something like a Bitcoin, there's a limited amount of numbers I can write out. That's what that cap is, right? So I'm only allowed to write this out a certain number of times. Um, it's not going to change the, the, the fundamental issue that you're dealing with mathematical nouns. This is... This is uh, and, and so, so where, where crypto becomes a lot more interesting when you go past this, right? So some of the more interesting experiments in the crypto world involve moving beyond the fixation on the mere token, right? Uh, I, I think I don't agree 100% with the counter trade and the, um, uh, the asset via versus liability kind of string of argumentation, but I, I see where you're coming from. So let's talk about um, the systems where you think crypto becomes interesting. Yeah, sure. I mean, partially to understand, uh, to understand the stuff, you kind of need to be, have a certain grounding in the historical battle between commodity versus credit thinking on money. All right. So commodity thinking of money is the, the de facto standard way people think about money. They think about it as an object carries value. It's like almost like a substance, right? It's like this imagined substance of value. And you either think about it as a literal substance or as a sort of metaphorical fictional substance. So for example, when you hear people say, make statements like money is just a collective belief in our heads, that's like a fictional substance of value um, metaphor. They're basically saying we've have these arbitrary objects and we've sort of just collectively agreed to imbue them with some substance like value. Okay. That's a very commodity way of thinking about money playing out in uh, a non-commodity token system, right? This is what, and actually crypto is full of this. So you'll find people being like, clearly the object isn't a commodity, but we're just going to like imagine that the community will imbue it with commodity like substance. All right. Through enough usage. Okay, this is very heavily commodity orientated. Now, there's an alternative theory or tradition in monetary thinking, which you'll be very exposed to if you do anthropology, um, which is credit thinking of money, where basically you see money as promises, right? So you um, will see money as IOUs issued out through, um, so I can get things by uttering promises. Um, and you know this through your friendship groups. I can go up to my friend and I can say something like, um, hey, please could you just give me a, uh, some i don't know can you can you give me some flour please um and i will you know i'll give it back to you at some other point basically what i just did there is i uttered a promise it came out of me and back came flour or whatever some kind of commodity 
right? So you can see the, the bi-directional structure, promise for thing. And so you basically you're paying by promise, okay? Um, and that's an IOU and you can formalize that if you want. You can write that out as a piece of paper. You can write it out on a computer. And these are IOU systems, right? And this is a sort of proto form of money. And our, our large scale monetary systems right now are like highly elaborate um, IOU systems. Now, if you're thinking about interesting forms of alternative money, you want to, at least for me, maintain this idea of paying by promise, but to sort of like make it more horizontal. So what I find fascinating is this idea of these kind of like peer-to-peer -peer networks of IOUs. So this right now, for example, is being exemplified in projects like trust lines, circles, um, which are trying to think about how do you create these sort of like vast network structures of rippling credit IOUs, right? Um, that to me is far more interesting as a monetary experiment than trying to just like issue out these like commodity like digital objects and hope that they get adapted by, uh, adopted by a community. I understand um, the two different facets of money that you're talking about. So basically the commodity like um, uh, be it a real commodity or like an imagined commodity uh, view on, on money and you know debt the first 5,000 years kind of uh, uh, approach. Ines, how much do you think, if you if you kind of think them to their logical end, um, what actually changes between the two systems? So basically, if you if you if you kind of pit them against another uh, one another, um, how do they look different? Um, you know, in uh, at the end of the day. So basically, how is the IOU system fundamentally different from the money as a commodity system? It's much more flexible and dynamic. That's the basic point. So if you're imagining monetary systems, if you know, human economies, if you, if you let's reverse back in time, like beyond capitalist economies, there's one common feature of all human economies throughout time. Um, the basic underlying reality of any com economy is human beings applying themselves to the earth. You know, every single thing in the, uh, the room around you right now comes from this process, right? A human being has applied themselves to the earth. Right. Everything comes from that. Um, and whether that's, you know, you applied yourself to the earth to build a piece of technology, which then subsequently enables you to build something else, the, the process is still the same. Right. Um, there is nothing that doesn't come from that. So the underlying substance, the underlying reality of like value and economy is human beings applying themselves. Right. And this is a dynamic process. It's organic. It shifts over time. It's not static or fixed. Okay, so if you're looking, and the other core feature of, it, of all human economies is interdependence, all right? So there is no historical solo wilderness man who fends for himself out in the wilderness. This is like a fantasy, right? Um, I'm always fascinated by watching like libertarian survival things where they imagine like wilderness survival. And I, I partly like that. I used to do this a lot myself, like wilderness survival stuff in South Africa, where you have this imagination. It's like what it's like to survive in the wilderness is you've got to go out and like build like a tent out of like leaves or something, you know, and like it's like Robinson Crusoe idea, right? If you actually go to a society where people survive in the wilderness, it looks nothing like this, right? So if you go to uncontacted groups in the Amazon, there is no solo wilderness men. People operate in these tight clans, right? Where you have high levels of interdependence. You basically survive upon each other as a unit, right? And this is the de facto starting point of all human economies is intense levels of interdependence. Now, the key thing in modern economies is that we, large scale monetary systems have sort of made those networks so huge that you start to perceive yourself as not being connected. All right. You, you ge it generates this like fantasy of individualism, which is what like typical of most like um, classical liberal thought, right? Um, even though you're intensely interdependent. Okay, so, um, and, and the reality of these interdependent networks though, that, that we survive upon is that they're highly dynamic. They morph, they change, there's population changes, there's all sorts of like, shifts going on. And if you're trying to rely upon a fixed monetary system to intermediate relations within a dynamic underlying economy, it's gonna break, basically, right? It breaks. You can't have rigid structures. So for example, even if you tried to, for example, use Bitcoin as the foundational uh, system, I guarantee what would happen is credit creation of money, all right? I guarantee you private banks 
would take that Bitcoin and issue new promises against it to expand the money supply automatically, precisely because it's too rigid to deal with the actual underlying dynamism of the economy. All right. You would literally have private market actors creating new forms of money in order to deal with the structural rigidity of the Bitcoin system, which is why it would literally break. Right. So uh, this is like if you're thinking about like that's what the problem is commodity thinking it's, it imagines the strange rigid stuff right whereas the, the credit thinking acknowledges this it says okay right now we depend upon these expandable and contractible systems to mediate these huge interdependent networks that we're, that we're dependent upon but there's huge power dynamics built into those monetary systems so what happens if for example we say let's try and flatten the power relations whilst maintaining the dynamism okay and that's what things like these rippling credit systems try to do. And I'm not saying they're going to work yet, but that's a very interesting intuition, all right? Um, to create these like expanding, contracting peer-to-peer -peer credit networks. Like I would, I would be motivated to actually work on something like that because that's actually interesting. What can people do? What can people do if they feel with you that um, the you know banking tech sector has become too powerful and they can kind of they want to um, help cash or help you know these rippling credit credit systems uh, wh wh where do you think people should start well i don't i mean i don't want to speak for everyone there's, there's different roles for different people and bear in mind just you know having earlier said I, I disagree with some of the monetary theory of things like bitcoin i still see it as useful in the context of the overall structure right so I'm not dissing anybody who decides they want to work on those systems. You know, you just got to kind of put yourself in context and understand where you sort of sit in the system, right? So sure, a rigid sort of collectible structure money thing kind of has a use in the global system, right? Um, this is I personally would don't want to put my efforts into that. Now, um, in terms of the cash question, the cash question is slightly different, right? It's like, how do you, uh, it's, it's working in the, existing monetary system and you're saying how do i want to try and stop the dystopian dynamics in the existing monetary system or at least slow them down by maintaining the cash system and that's really like a policy question to some extent you need basically a top-down action you need people to be saying we have to lobby for the protection of the cash system to provide us with this like buffer against total bank domination all right um so that's the issue around people who want to work on policy or protection of the cash system. And, and bear in mind, the cash system is super, super important for over half the world's population. So it is a massive system um, and it gets so little protection in the public realm, even though it's so huge and so dependent upon, right? It's the world's most widespread use of payment, all right? Um, if you're interested in the more idealistic end of things, like if you're interested in like new experimentation, which I imagine most people listening to this podcast are probably more on that end, um, then sure, you should be thinking about like, um, I, but least personally, I would be interested in like, how do you create non-static uh, or like dynamic forms of credit-based money systems using crypto technology? I think that's super interesting. And I would, I would love to see the energy that gets poured into the kind of like hard money stuff being redirected towards like dynamic money stuff, right? Um, I think that'd be like, and I think it already is. I think it's already, it's, we're already seeing it in the fact that the, that the Bitcoin community increasingly tries to distance itself from the broader like uh, Web3 world, right? Because actually many people in the sort of broader movement are starting to intuit that there's something a little bit like toxic um, lurking below the surface of a lot of that sort of conservative thinking of money. Um, so there's something interesting happening right now. Cool. Thank you, Brett. Um, tell us about your book. Where can it be bought? Can it be bought on Amazon or do I need to go to a physical bookstore to buy it? Uh, it can definitely be bought on Amazon. You know, I, I, I do recognize the, the contradictions of the systems that we live in and the fact that actually we all have to be dependent upon these systems, even if we critique them. So it is available on Amazon. It's also, I would encourage people to try and go to their local bookstores and pay with cash, um, to, to do it, but I'm not going to judge you if you don't, if you don't do that. Um, <laughs> and it's coming out in nine languages, 10 languages. Uh, so uh, this coming month is coming out in Dutch, Spanish, Italian, German, but the English versions already exist. Um, it'll be out in Portuguese and Korean and Chinese and various other languages too in due course. Perfect. And where can people learn more about 
you and what you're up to. Is Twitter a good place to follow you? Yeah, I mean, I'm on I'm on Twitter as Suit Possum, which is a I won't explain that now, but like a Suit Possum, you know, S U I T P O S S U M. Um, but I, I think right, I mean, for people who are interested in the sort of the, some of the stuff I've been talking about, maybe my newsletter, uh, my Substack newsletter, which is Brett Scott at dot Substack dot com, which is called Altered States of Monetary Consciousness. Um, I put out these pieces about this kind of stuff on there, although that's been on a little bit of a Uh, a temporary hiatus while I'm promoting the book, but that'll get going again pretty soon. Uh, so yeah, check out my newsletter. Thank you for coming on, Brad. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. This was a fun discussion. <laughs>